Good day, folks. Um, here we are. Another week has gone by. We are now into the month of August. Seems the summer is just kind of slipping away here. And I hope uh, you all had a chance this past week to enjoy some of the, the summer weather wherever you are and some of the family times you might have been able to have. Here where we are in Alberta, it's a long weekend and uh, many folks take that opportunity to go away and go camping, etc. Also, just thank you for inviting me in to your homes or your places, wherever you're listening or watching this particular video. Thank you so much. Appreciate that a lot. And today we're going to continue along in our sermon series in 1 Peter, A Living Hope. As we move now further into chapter 2, we began last week with chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And today we're going to be working uh, forward and moving along into chapter verse uh, up to chapter 10 of second chapter. I just want to begin by uh, posing this question to you. And I'm kind of wondering if you, the audience, have ever heard the term expressive individualism. You might have heard the term individualism, but have you ever heard this phrase together, expressive individualism? A fellow by the name of Trevin Wax, uh, writing for the Gospel Coalition, presented an eight-part expose on this particular topic, expressive individualism. And in that eight-part expose, he presents a case for how the church, quote, can be the salt and light in this kind of culture. Of course, he's speaking about our popular culture in the West. And Trevor points to the slogans that identify uh, this kind of philosophical approach in popular culture. You may have heard some of these, you might have even, someone might have even said them to you, or maybe you even said them yourself. Here's the first slogan, you be you. Or follow your heart, or be true to yourself, or find yourself. Trevin, in his presentation, uh, traces also, and he does a thorough job, and I want to mention this just briefly, the historical beginnings and identify some of the key individuals who over the past 150 years best represent expressive individualism. So we know that this is not a new thing. It is a continuing thing in our Western culture. So we want to boil Trevor's presentation down to its core uh, regarding expressive individualism. It goes something like this. The chief purpose is uh, to quote Trevin, quote, find one's deepest self and express that identity in ways that counter whatever family, friends, political affiliations, previous generations or religious authorities might say. And in his uh, expose, he also highlights some authors and one particular author is a fellow by the name of Mike Sayers. I did not have a chance to uh, do any research on this individual, but he wrote a book uh, called Disappearing Church. And uh, Trevin highlights uh, seven beliefs that Sayer puts in this book in regards to expressive individualism in our culture, society. Now, with your permission, I've picked three of the seven uh, to give you some sort of a sample of Sayer's book. So, the first one, in our expressive individualism in the West, the highest good is, of course, individual freedom happiness, self-definition, and self-expression. Secondly, uh, traditions such and religions and received wisdom through the ages, rules and social ties that restrict an individual's freedoms or their happiness, um, their self-definition, their self-expression must be reshaped or deconstructed and even, if needed, destroyed. And the last one that I just want to highlight for you, humans are fundamentally good. Well, this brings us to an important question, my friends. How does expressive individualism pose a threat for the church trying to remain faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Time is, as usual, not on our side, so we'll just keep this very short and concise. Expressive individualism challenges the church according to Trevin, because the church proclaims a message that is radically God-centered. That'd be his own words, and I would agree with that. That's biblically provable, and it's evident in the scriptures. Whereas, 
expressive individualism would have you and me uh, look deep within ourselves, deep into our hearts, quote unquote. And there, when we discover our inner self, we express that to the culture, privately and in the, pop, in, in the public square as well. And so I was pondering all this that I, I've shared with you and more, and I have this question that came in my mind. What does God think about this philosophy, this ideological approach of the inner self? Now, uh, this is not to say that we're not individuals, that God created us in his likeness and Im image. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about what we've coined here, or not coined, but we say here, in expressive individualism. So what does God think about that? Well, there's a lot of places we could go. But just give me, I'll just give you one example. We go to Jeremiah the prophet in the 17th chapter. And there God through his prophet said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Good question. And then God answers his own question. I, Yahweh, search the heart and test the mind to give to every person according to their ways, according to the fruit of their deeds. Jeremiah chapter 17, 9 and 10. Well, with all this in mind, we turn now to 1 Peter chapter 2, and um, we'll be reading from verse 4 through to 10. Verse 4 through to 10 together. Chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm a lay, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. The Holy Spirit, a living God, just fill us now and illuminate our understanding, uh, impact our hearts, and motivate us into our hands and feet to be the bearer of the good news of Jesus Christ and his gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, before we uh, take a close look at verse 4 to 10, uh, we would better serve by understanding the why question. Why the Apostle Peter in the text was quoting from the Old Testament, from Isaiah and Psalms. For you see, us 21st century citizens are faced here today with terms like living stone and cornerstone and royal priesthood and holy nation. And we see here even the Apostle Peter identifying the elect exiles, that is his audience, as living stones. So why is all this metaphorical? Why with what's with all why all this metaphorical like language? Pa pardon me. Well, if you and I don't know why the why or why Peter and other New Testament writers use language like we find in our text today, we might miss the intent of the authors of the New Testament, what they were trying to articulate to their first century audience. Because what we have here in our text today, verse 4 to 10, uh, is more than a metaphor. What we have here in this text is a case of what is called in theology or biblical theology, biblical typology. So I'd ask your patience as you, and bear with me as we briefly, and we'll be very as brief as possible, unpack biblical typology. Now, you could actually do your own research on this. You can, there's commentaries that you could use. There's uh, dictionaries, Bible dictionaries. There's good resources 
on the internet, like uh, Ligonier Ministries. You can type in uh, what is biblical typology, and it'll take you. And one of the hits would be Ligonier Ministries. You'll find uh, some terms in there that you'll be able to help you. So, but today we want to ask this question, what is biblical typology? Well, someone said this, quote, biblical typology is a special kind of symbolism. Now, I think that's somewhat simplified, but for today it is to the point. For example, what is a symbol? An example I gave earlier this morning during the worship service, I said, you know, you're driving along with your kids along the highway, you come into a community, a town, a city, and you see the golden arches. What are the golden arches? Well, the golden arches um, um, represent something else. They represent McDonald's, fast food restaurants. So with this in mind, uh, let's try this definition of a biblical type. See, when we open the pages of our Bibles, we will find that a type is either a person or a thing in the Old Testament. A person or a thing in the Old Testament that foreshadows a person or a thing in the New Testament. We have a good example even here in our text, verse 4 to 10 of a biblical type. We also find one in the third chapter of Peter's letter here in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 22. If you go there, you'll see the Apostle Peter is unpacking the work of Christ on the cross when he said that Christ suffered once for the sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring, to us, bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. That's uh, chapter uh, 3, verse 18. Then the apostle appealed to a historical event, and that's key. Remember, this is what he's appealing to, is an actual historical event. And what was that? Oh, the days of Noah, as Peter put it. That is the flood in the ark that saved eight persons from the water. So the apostle here using this historical event of the flood is a type of baptism. Peter would say baptism which corresponds to this in verse 21, chapter 3. What corresponds to baptism? A biblical type, the flood of Noah. Now, there's a few important things we need to remember. When we say someone, for example, is a type of Christ, we are saying that a person in the Old Testament behaves in a way that corresponds to Jesus' actions and his character in the New Testament. To be clear, this would be different than when we say something uh, is, say, typical of Christ. There one would be saying that an object or event in the Old Testament is really just a representative of the quality of Christ, of one of his qualities, say, one of his characteristics, love. So we have to be careful not to confuse typical with biblical types, because this is, biblical types come from a study of the Bible uh, using the biblical theological method. And you can look that up too if you want to know what more what that is. But I think it makes sense. Biblical, theological, understanding who God is through the story of, of, of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We uncover that as we read through the text. Now we need to, uh, again, as I said, not confuse something like typical with the biblical types. Again, we go back to that. Uh, definition we began with, quote, biblical typology is a special kind of symbolism. And we need to do, my friends, we need to do our due diligence and learn the differences so we can unpack this text before us in all Bible texts properly and as accurately as possible. And it helps us uh, to prevent you and me from imposing something on the text uh, from an external source You know, maybe it's our religious traditions or family traditions or even from our culture. We want to we don't want to do that. And even our own personal biases. We must keep in mind. Here's the thing. Biblical types are grounded in history. When we study the word of God using this biblical theological method, it will reveal to us. Clearly, God's redemptive plan located in history. As one commentator really put it so well and concise, quote, whenever New Testament authors identify, identify a type, they do so in a way that highlights its historicity. So in summary, 
A, bi a biblical type is, a, is not an illustration or simil similarity. And a type is always identified as a type in the New Testament. Secondly, biblical typology is always determined by the scripture. It's not something that's imposed outside of scripture, not imposed outside the inspired word of God. And last but not least, biblical types are rooted in history. So we want to apply what we learned here briefly about biblical types to the text before us. So let's read together verse 4 and 5 of 2 Peter. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house. Here the Apostle Peter, in one sense, applied a stone metaphor to the first century community as a spiritual house. This is in verse 5. We see other New Testament authors talking about buildings and houses, and more importantly, temple. For example, Luke in Acts chapter 7, to share one there for you, Apostle Paul in a few of his letters, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 3 of that letter, and the Apostle John also in Revelation 21, along with Apostle Peter here in our text, introducing God's people, the new community, the new covenant church, as a house, building, or a temple. That's an important, important thing to remember. We can go to the Apostle Paul for an example. We'll give you two examples here, one from Paul, one from Hebrews. Paul, in his first letter to the church in Corinth, said this, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. And the other is from the letter to the Hebrews, and there the author in chapter 3, highlighting for his audience that Jesus is greater than Moses. And said this, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as servant to testify to the things that were spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house. He's speaking here to the New Testament church, which we are part of as well. We can say that the Apostle Peter and these other New Testament authors highlight the idea of God's people as a house, a building, or a temple. In other words, this is a reapplication of Old Testament types, a reinterpretation of the Old Testament temple, especially in the New Testament letters. And this is also found in three of four Gospels, four Gospel accounts in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and John. Let's turn to John, chapter 2, and there John records the uh, early in the Gospel, the first time Jesus cleansed the temple in Jerusalem. You know, remember the story from the Passion Week? Same here. He drove out the money changers, the sheep and pigeon sellers. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables here early in his ministry. You find that in John chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. And of course, like the second time, Jesus is also challenged by the Jews, to, in this case, to show them a sign for doing what he has done. And Jesus said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. John chapter 2, verse 19. We know they responded, it took 40 years to build this temple. But what was Jesus speaking of here? Jesus, like the New Testament authors, was using an Old Testament type and reapplying it to himself. For John the Apostle would say, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, that destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up, and that then they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. John chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. So let's press pause for a moment and let's ask this other question. What are the implications of the Apostle Peter's statement for the church in the first century and through the age up to our time here in the 21st century? century. Well, let's begin by reading verse 5 again together. Verse 5 of chapter 2. Let's read that together. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's verse 5. 
And now we can turn to another book, and this one in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 19. We see there God had delivered Israel from Egypt, and we find them they were encamped before Mount, they were encamped before Mount Sinai. This is the wilderness area around Mount Sinai. Moses then went up the mountain to God, and we find in the text this: the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying to Moses, "Tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians." and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus chapter 19, verse 1 to 6. I just read a couple of verses out of that section. You know, it's really interesting here because it seems to me, and I hope it seems to you too, that Exodus provides the answer to our question. What are the implications of the Apostle Peter's statement here in verse 4 and 5? Let's remember, when we began this series, that we found that Peter's audience were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire, present-day Turkey, facing, as Peter said in verse 6 of chapter 1, uh, various trials. They've been grieving the various trials they'd gone through. You see, the believers were facing a variety of trials, as we learned from family and friends, from workmates, from the culture around them, from local governments, and we know sooner than later they would get the Roman Empire would be persecuting them as well with a little more viciousness. These first century followers of Christ trying to understand the ramification of their salvation in Christ. In a real way, if you think about it, attempting to find their identity now as God's people post-Pentecost, the day the Holy Spirit came down on those initial 120 in the upper room. And Peter, his pastoral heart here, is trying to help the people by reinterpreting an Old Testament type. Peter and other New Testament, by the way, they're authorized to do this. They, they were made apostles by Jesus himself and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the letter that we have before us. Peter and the other New Testament authors using a historical, factual historical event of God's people called in Exodus to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And now this new covenant church is a spiritual house, a spiritual temple, we could say, verse 5. This new covenant church described by Peter here in verse 9 a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. There we see the same language we found in Exodus chapter 19, reinterpreted to the New Testament church. So, as we move along here, we we remind ourselves now, we we were challenged at the start as Trevin Wax unpacked for us, and we used a briefly expressive individualism and how it saturated the Western culture where everything seems to be open to be challenged if it prevents a person from attaining uh, their so-called true inner self. Anything that hinders a person's uh, idea of happiness, whatever that may be, is either to be reshaped, deconstructed, or even destroyed. Now we don't have time to to dig too deep to see the consequences of what the Word of God calls sinful rebellion against a holy and just God in our culture. And I'm sure you can think of ways that you've seen that. You know, Wax was identifying that expressive individualism poses a problem that you're trying to remain faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think we can agree with Wax that that is an issue. But sadly, as you think about it, as I thought about it, Individualism has also found its way into the body of Christ. Someone called this, quote, our innate individualism, the ever-present sinfulness of our individualistic heart. The idea that some who call themselves Christians today think they're smarter than others. There is a prevalent attitude in the church to do it yourself. We find Christians withdrawing from the community of believers, from the church, And I'm just going to go on record and say this quite clearly. While it was necessary during a a time, and it's still helpful in many different ways, 
There's no such thing as online church. There's no such thing as that. Not according to the Bible. And therefore, we find Christians withdrawing from community, uh, physically, relationally, or even emotionally, and possibly all three. Yet here, the Apostle Peter, in his letter, stressing that the identity of the people of God, the church, is first and foremost, what? Grounded in an historical event. He said that back in the first chapter, verse 3. What is this historical event? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Their faith and trust in the resurrection of Christ have provided the church, as he tells us in verse 4 of chapter 1, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and kept in heaven for you. You see, Peter's audience struggling to find their identity as the people of God in the midst of their trials. And you and me today, in the midst of our trials, as a community of believers struggling with our own trials in an expressive, individualistic culture, we have a living hope that is imperishable, undefiled, and kept in heaven. A living hope because of an historic event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And God, through his Son, Jesus Christ, calls the individual believer living stones. The church is full of living stones according to Peter, are being built up as a spiritual house, a spiritual temple, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ, verse 5. Now, there's so much more that we can unpack in these seven wonderful verses. And I found that we could probably preach through these seven verses over the next two or three weeks, maybe even more. So maybe one day we'll come back to do that another time. But with our remaining time, the next few minutes, we turn our attention to the Apostle Peter's use of the Old Testament Scripture. He begins verse 6 by saying, For it stands in Scripture. Here now, Peter appealing to the Bible, to the Holy Word of God, the Old Testament. We see here the Apostle quoting basically word for word, it seems. Isaiah 28, 14, here in verse 6. Psalm 118, verse 22, verse 7, which is the most quoted Old Testament text in the New Testament, as, as far as I understand. And Isaiah 8, 14, and verse 8. I want us to focus on the term, the cornerstone. Now we know that a cornerstone was used in the ancient Near East to hold together two walls. You have two walls, and you have the cornerstone holding those two walls together. It was a key stone an essential stone for the structural integrity of a building. And now we see the Apostle Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to select Old Testament Scripture to reinterpret Old Testament types for the New Testament church. And as a cornerstone held two walls together, um, Jesus Christ joins together Christians into one body devoted to God the Father. The Apostle Paul put it this way in his, second, in his letter to Ephesus. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Through him who? Jesus. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. This is the New Testament apostles and prophets and Old Testament prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 to 22. The Bible says that each individual believer is a temple for the Holy Spirit. And together we are being built up as the temple, uh, as the temple of uh, the household of God. Apostle Peter, encouraging his audience in their trials, remember that it was for their honor that Jesus Christ had become their cornerstone, chosen and precious. Verse 6, Jesus Christ, the head of the church. For they had believed in Christ, even though others did not believe. Verse 7. 
And we must mention just briefly, and for those who did not believe Christ, Christ becomes a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Verse 8. So when we consider the expressive individualism of our Western culture, passionately pursuing self, and we consider those who call themselves Christians yet pursue self, the Apostle Peter could not be clear as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit concerning self-seekers. He said they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Verse 7. So friends, this kind of wraps things up for me and for you. In conclusion, I want to leave the final word for the Apostle Peter for an encouragement to, to, to you today, whatever trial or tribulation, whatever issues you're facing in our expressive individualistic culture, as we stand and try to be faithful as best we can to the gospel of Jesus Christ, let the Apostle Peter's words remind you, remind you of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that has resulted in. Peter said, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for this message. I pray it encourages those that are listening. Bless them, Lord, today. Watch over them, protect them from the schemes of the evil one. And may they walk from this message and give you all the glory as they share the good news of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Shalom.